Well, greetings, brethren. It's good to be with you today. The uh, title of my sermon is Mission Statement. Now, a lot of companies have a mission statement or a vision statement that may not be posted on the wall, but it is understood by the employees and management. Before retirement, in the last years of employment, I worked for a repair facility. We did repairs on all types of gas meters, uh, from residential meters to industrial and commercial meters, which, as you go in that direction, they just get larger and larger. We even repaired and tested electric meters. We expanded our services from gas to electric, and of course it created more income for the company, so that was a very successful project. Not only did we repairs, but we were we did the testing and adjusting of the meters to government standards, and we were and we were cert, certified. We were a certified facility um, approved by the government to put seals on meters with the date stamped on them in a manner to avoid tampering with the meters. Now, if you have a close look at your gas meter, you'll notice there's a wire l linking through the some of the screws have little holes in them and they put wires in there with a seal, a metal seal, and it's got a date on it. And the purpose of that is to avoid tampering. So if a, a meter reader notices that the seal has been broken, the wire, it, it's suspicious that somebody has been tampering with the meter and oftentimes they'll just uh, replace the meter or put another seal on. When I was uh, still working, we were in a training session in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and I heard a very interesting story uh, about an electric meter reader in the area. One of the instructors was telling us this story, but he was saying that this meter reader, uh, he wanted to build a, a shed out of brick, and he just he didn't have the money, so he was trying to think how to get, you know, the materials and, and pay minimum amount to it. So he had this idea. So on the weekend at the local bar, he was drinking with a few friends of his, having a beer, and he kind of hushed his voice down, and he told the group of about three or four men, he says, I want to tell you something, but he says, you've got to keep it a, a secret. You can't tell anybody. He says, if you take a brick and you put it on top of your electric meter, you'll save about 10% of your electric bill. But, I, but he said, don't tell anybody. Well, of course, these guys all told their friends. So the meter reader was reading meters about once a month. So, of course, you know, he'd go around and he'd... Eventually, he had enough bricks to build the whole shed because everybody put a brick out there. And, of course, he would take them off and then he would, they would put another one on. So it was quite a scheme that he developed. But uh, they all fell for the story, which I, I really found quite interesting. But uh, we have... <laughs> The company has ways to determine whether or not something's been tampered with. Usually if the bill jumps 10% one way or the other, they usually send out someone to investigate why this is happening. Meters, regardless of gas or electric, they, they just can't be left in service for an indefinite period of time. The reason is they're mechanical devices, and they have moving parts. And of course, moving parts, they wear out in time. And what happens is they go beyond the the standards that the government uh, prescribes. If the problem, if the calibration goes out in favor of the customer, well, that means that the customer is getting a little bit more gas than what he has paid for. So a cubic feet might be 1.1 cubic feet. So the company, as a result, is losing income. And you can imagine a company with millions of meters out there, and if there was just a slight, you know, error in it, in the customer's favor, they're losing huge amount of money. So that's why these governments have these sort of, these calibration standards that got to be maintained. If the calibration goes the other way, where the customer is not getting a full cubic foot for a cubic foot that he pays, well, of course, the company is making money. So there are standards in place so that and regulate it so that this doesn't occur. For residential meters, they're usually in service about eight years and then they're replaced with new ones or they're replaced 
with a meter that's been recalibrated and uh, repaired. Our shop, our shop had a mission statement and it was in bold letters written on the wall, right up on the wall, big bold letters, and it, this is what it stated. We shall provide excellent customer satisfaction at competitive costs by striving for zero defects using continuous improvement. And the one thing about, excuse me, one thing about our shop, they are very uh, training oriented. So they, they were, it was a really great company to work for because they would send you out for training to keep ahead of the curve as far as technology and standards in that. So when I was working uh, in that shop, uh, I worked there probably about 10 or 11 years before retirement. I, I did a lot of traveling. We traveled all over the States and had training and gas meters and electric meters. So it was a great company to work for. The uh, vision statement, which wasn't posted on the wall, stated, we provide customers with reliable, high quality measurement products and technology expertise, safe, innovative, efficient. So this was the criteria as we, uh, as a group worked at the shop and, you know, aimed to achieve. So it was a great place to work you know, because of, of the conditions that was uh, regulated temperature-wise because of the calibration requirements. You can't have, it, the temperature was maintained all year round at a certain point and it didn't vary more than two degrees. So you weren't freezing in the winter and sweating in the summertime. So it, it, and it was clean, clean environment. You, you couldn't have dust and dirt around because when you're dealing with calibration of, you know, sensitive instruments. So it was a really great place to work. And I was fortunate enough, you know, to work for the company. And of course, I've been retired now for something like 14 years. So today I want to look at several mission statements. And the first one I want to look at is the individual mission statement of church members. A church members, church members are admonished to grow in grace and knowledge. If you'd like to turn to Second Peter, the third chapter, and verse uh, 17 and 18, Second Peter 3 and verse 17 says, says, I should say, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away by the error of the wicked. So he's admonishing the members to be stern and firm and, and not fall away from what they've been taught. And in verse 18 he says, But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So the admonition is to grow in grace and knowledge. To achieve this, it takes effort. As we have been admonished by the ministry, is to utilize the tools, the four tools that God has given us, to utilize them to achieve the task that has been given to us. And those are namely prayer, Bible study, occasional fasting, and meditation. And I know that we've been talking about this, but it's it's so crucial. I mean, it's so crucial to attain that goal of growing in grace and knowledge. There are just, there's no other way to do it. That is the way, and that's just the way it is. These four tools are similar to commandments. They don't change. And they are the only way to achieve the goal of growing in grace and knowledge. I'm sure if there was another way, God would have included it in his Bible, but he didn't. I mean, it's like the Ten Commandments. People think they're going to improve on that. Well, you can't improve on perfection. It's just a matter of whether you're going to obey and listen or not. Not trying to improve the Ten Commandments. It's an accumulated goal by our efforts and by being engaged. Doing nothing in this regards will achieve nothing. So we have to be diligent in working on it. We, 
We have to support the work with our tithes and offerings and not fall short in that responsibility. Let's look at Malachi. The book of Malachi talks about this. In Malachi, the third chapter, if you'd like to turn there, <clears throat> Malachi 3. And Malachi 3 and verse 8 says, it asks the question, will a man rob God? Yet, here's the answer, you have robbed me. But you say, Christ says, in what way have we robbed you? And the answer is, in tithes and offerings. And then he goes on in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. Why are they cursed? Because they weren't paying the tithes and offerings. For you have robbed me. So not paying tithes and offerings is robbing God. I mean, you wouldn't think of going into a bank with a gun and robbing a bank, but tithes and offerings is robbing God. Even this whole nation, but that can be applied to the church. We just got to be careful not to be in that position where we're robbing God from tithes and offerings. And in verse 10, he says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse. Don't try to cut God short as far as tithes. Tithes is 10%. You're not doing God a favor by saying, well, I'll give you 8%. I mean, you know, you can get along without it. No, it, the tithes is 10%. And offerings, that's not stated. That's according to how you're blessed. So you can go before God and determine how much you're blessed, and then you can act accordingly. I mean, God doesn't expect you to do something that you, you or give that what you don't have. I mean, he's a reasonable God. Uh, okay, going on here, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord. So he, he's saying, try me. In other words, you don't know if it works unless you try it. And he's sort of nudging them, saying, well, listen, just try me, and you'll see the results. And of course... <laughs> You should never do something with expecting, you know, really, really, uh, I'll, I'll tithe and I'll be a millionaire next week. That's not the way we're supposed to approach it. it you, uh, you apply the principle of generosity of heart and wanting to serve God. And he goes on, he says, If I will not open to you the window of heavens and pour out such a blessing that you will not have room to receive it. So God promised them a blessing if they were tithing, paying tithes and offerings, that he would bless them tremendously. And for us, I mean, when you look at the end result or reward, you can't compare money to the reward we're going to get. So we have to faithfully pay our tithes and offerings is what God was trying to get through to us in Malachi. Another thing we have to do is... Uh, as far as this mission statement, this is all about our mission statement. Um, we have to support um, the ministry through prayers. And if you go over to Colossians, the fourth chapter, we'll read verses uh, 2 and 3 in Colossians 4. Paul, writing here, he says, Continue earnestly to pray, I'm sorry, in prayer, being vigilant, in it with thanksgiving. So he's admonishing us to be vigilant, <laughs> vigilant in prayer and with thanksgiving. In verse 3, meanwhile, praying for us, also for us, that God would open us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. So he's admonishing us to pray that God will open the door for us to get the gospel out, which is part of our responsibility as individuals to support that. And we got to do it diligently and uh, in a right attitude. Also, we're admonished to pray for the protection of the ministry. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, if you'd like to turn there, 2 Corinthians the first chapter, we'll read verses 8 to 11. This is Paul speaking again. He says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even for life. Well, you know, brethren, 
you can face such a severe trial. You may think in your mind, I, I can't handle this anymore. And, and it sounds like this is where they're at. Uh, above strength, in other words, I don't have the strength to put up with this, even to the despair of life. And even Isaiah, I believe it was, he got so discouraged, you know, he said, well, just, just take my life. Let's get this over with and I'll just rest in the grave till the resurrection. But you got to go on. You just, you can't take that attitude. In, in verse 9, it says, yes, we have the, had, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but God who raised, raised the dead. So to come to the realization that we just got to push on, and even if this kills us, God is able to raise the death, the dead, who delivered us from a great death. So they, God delivered them, and does not, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. So they faced trials. God helped them through that. They realized that God was helping them, and that strengthened their faith. And in verse eleven, you also together, helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted us through many. So he was asking the brethren to pray for him. And thankfully, at this current time at least, we're not going through that type of trials, but we still, as the ministry, face trials. Some of them, we're all tested in one way or the other. Some of us have health issues. Others have other issues, but... Uh, Praying for us really helps us. I remember one time a minister said to his congregation, to the members, he says, you're not praying enough for me. And he was right because he could, he was, I guess he was going through all kinds of problems and he just couldn't figure out why. And it's amazing, the, you know, like it says, the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, brethren praying for the ministry really, really helps. Another thing in our mission is to pray for growth in the church. And over in Matthew chapter 9, we'll read number read verse 38, Matthew 9, 38, it's this is Christ speaking. It says, Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Well, you can take this two ways. You pray for the growth in the membership. And you can pray for the growth in the ministry as required to fulfill the needs as there is growth. So our mission statement involves drawing close to God, supporting the work through tithes and offerings, praying for the ministry, and for growth in the church. That kind of outlines the membership mission statement. The second point <laughs> is the mission statement of the church. And that's found in Matthew 28. If you'd like to turn there, Matthew 28. And verse uh, 19 and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the admonition is to make disciples. Of course, that's through them being called and, and, and the ministries involved in that, including the baptism and teaching them to observe all things. In other words, teaching them about the commandments of God and what's required of us, and having a correct understanding of, of the scriptures and not trying to put your own twist on it. Also in, in Mark, the 13th chapter, and verse 10, Mark 13, 10, it states, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So we have to teach 
the gospel to all nations, or available to all nations. I mean, I don't think there's anybody on the planet that doesn't have a cell phone. Access, access is the key word to the truth of God, the truth that we're proclaiming. So the commission is to baptize member, member baptize those God calls, and of course, baptism is really determined by the ministry, how well a, a person is coming along, and it includes baptism, and this potentially adds to the future family of God, if members are faithful to the end. I mean, there's a requirement involved in the, this commitment to be baptized, and that's a familiar scripture in Matthew 24, and verse 13, it says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So it's an endurance race. God didn't say it was easy. He says narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life, and wide is the gate that <laughs> leads to the other way if you don't repent. I mean, he never ever said it would be easy, but he did expect us to endure to the end. That's an expectation. And there's a reward for enduring to the end. It's not like, what's in it for me? There is a great reward. Let's go down to the next verse in Matthew 24. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. Notice how it's worded. It doesn't say, the gospel of the kingdom might be preached or will fall short of the mark. It will be preached to all the world as a witness. And of course, like I said, I mean, that doesn't mean that every individual on the planet has a full understanding of the plan of God, but they have access to it electronically, basically. I mean, when it talks in Revelation about the, the two witnesses being dead in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, how does the whole world, this is happening? It says the whole world are giving gifts to one another. Well, the whole world is not standing around the streets of Jerusalem, you know, looking at these dead bodies. They've got to be, they're being seen because of, of the electronic age. They all have cell phones. I'm sure that'll be all over the news. These two guys that made our life miserable are now dead, so there's a great rejoicing. Well, it's through these devices that we have that that knowledge and understanding can reach the world. So thinking that unless we have every person in every corner of the world fully understand that's, I mean, the world would have to go on for several more thousand years, which we don't have that much time. So obviously that's you know, accomplished through the electronic age. Over in uh, Mark 16 and verse 15, he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here again, make it available for everyone. And let's look at Paul's view on this responsibility. Over in Romans, the first chapter, and verse 15, Romans 1, 15, it says, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So, he had a zeal for preaching the gospel. Even when he was in chains, he sent out letters and encouragement and, of course, the brethren in Rome could come and visit him. He wasn't restricted in that sense, you know, tied to a post. But it was like, like you say, house arrest. He had a lot of movement, and uh, he could accept visitors. So he got the gospel out. And over in Romans, the 10th chapter, and it, here Paul, once again, he said, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Well, brethren, I have to stop wearing sandals because my feet are not beautiful. 
I mean, <laughs> they're just not. As you get older, you get arthritis in areas where, you know, you can't normally see, but, you know, your toes, they do strange things. So I just won't be exhibiting my feet. But his point here is, unless they're sent, you know, you won't hear about them. So God arranges for things to open so that the ministry can get the message out there. So this is an ongoing commission, and with one other aspect to it about preaching the gospel to the world as a witness. And you notice it's as a witness, it's not trying to browbeat and force people at gunpoint to listen to your message or to respond to it. Those responsibilities are with God. I mean, he does the calling. Mr. Armstrong has said, and some of you older members will remember that, Trying to convert someone is like going out to a cow and preaching the, uh, the gospel to the cow. That's a, about as much of a response you're going to get if that's what you're trying. It's, it's God that does the calling. Where He expects us to do the work leading up to that and follow up after, after he calls them. Over in Ezekiel, this is another aspect of the mission of the church. Uh, in, ch in chapter 33, I'd like to start off in, in verse 1, Ezekiel 33, verse 1, he says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes them away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. So what he's saying is that if the warning is sound clearly, and the person does not do nothing about it. He's been warned. The blood is upon his own head for not responding to the warning. But he who takes warning will save his life. So if you respond, of course, you're going to save your life. And in verse 6, it says, But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, not just a large group, but anyone, in other words, even one person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will be required of the watchman's hands. So there's quite a responsibility of, of a watchman, not to lay down on the job, but to do his job of, of warning. We have to sound the alarm of what's coming and also why. And the main reason is because of sin. And we are accomplishing this through what? The booklets, the update, standing watch, and sermons which are posted online. I mean, the standing, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Link. Mr. Link uses the standing watch. How many times has he said that the United States is going into captivity? I'm sure people just think, oh, pff, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No way. And especially when he says it's coming from Europe, everybody thinks it's going to come from China or Russia. But the Bible clearly states it's going to come from Europe. Well, they don't. They just shun that. They just, they just don't believe it. But at least the warning's getting out there. You can't accuse Mr. Lincoln of not warning them. And, and look at the booklets we have, the rise and fall of the Jerusalem people, the rise and fall of America all warnings of what's coming. So it's their responsibility to act upon what they read. Our responsibility is to put it out there. And going down uh, into verse 8 of Ezekiel 33, When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall surely die in his iniquity, 
but his blood will I require at your hands. So it's quite a responsibility to be a, you know, a watchman and, and declaring the uh, warnings that are coming. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So we cannot be accused, brethren, of not getting the warning out there. I mean, it's like the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. Nobody can accuse us of not getting the warning out there. We were just, and uh, we will continue to do it. I mean, how, if you tell a nation that you're going down and, you know, you read about a third dying from the famine and the pestilence and a third from the war, I mean, that's two thirds right there. You're warning people that death is coming. You can't make it any more clear than that. If they don't respond, you've done your job. That's, it's on their head. Another aspect of the mission statement is found in the book of John in the uh, 21st chapter of John. John 21 and verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, this is Peter answering, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he and Christ said to him, Feed my lambs. And in verse 16, And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, Tend my sheep. Verse 17, He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said that. Yeah, he was getting tired of hearing that. I can understand why he was grieved. He said, what? are you deaf? I said twice already that I love you. He's getting a bit frustrated. And he said a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, I mean, Christ was doing this for a purpose. So you've got to look at, what he said here, he said, the church is to spiritually feed the sheep. That's what he meant, not, you know, invite them out for dinner three, four times a week. Feed the sheep meant feed them spiritually. And tend the sheep is a little different aspect, isn't it? It's to make sure they're okay. Encourage them. Counsel with them. Feeding them meat in due season. So there's two aspects of this, being fed spiritually and looking after them. I mean, protecting them, in other words, if they're starting to believe some crazy doctrines or going off the track a bit, you just don't say, oh, well, it's a train wreck. We'll stand on the side and watch the train go off the tracks. You make every effort to put that individual or a group, as far as that goes. I mean, the whole church in Corinthians were putting up with sin, not just one individual. And they had to be, you know, rebuked for that and, and repent of it. But it's, it's the ministry's job. to. It's not always pleasant but to correct the individual, try to encourage them to get back on the track. Keep them going in the right direction. So the ministry of the church had, has the responsibility to baptize those that are called, feed the sheep, tend the sheep, and preach the gospel to the world as a witness, plus give the warning of impending disaster to the nations, especially the modern-day Israel nations who are going into captivity, which will be a real shock to them right now. Even if they hear the warning, they don't think it can happen to them. And they don't, not only that, they don't think it will happen at all, period. There is a rude awakening coming for them, brethren. There really is. So that basically summarizes the mission uh, statement of that's given to the church. The third one I want to cover is the mission 
statement of Satan. And what is that? To attempt one more time to overthrow God and take over the rulership of the universe and the total spiritual realm. Attempt to destroy the church through compromise and individual members to fall short spiritually so they can lose out on salvation. Failing this is to totally destroy mankind physically. It's like a dog in a manger. He can't eat the straw, but he doesn't want to let the sheep get at it. And this is the mentality of Satan. I mean, you've seen a child. He's got 15 toys in front of him, and there's another child comes along and wants to take one or share, and he, he grabs it off of him. He's not playing with that, but he doesn't want to share. <laughs> it's funny. My own little grandson, we observed that. He was at a birthday party, and, and he had a toy, and another kid wanted to play with it. So he didn't want him to. I mean, he, he was playing with another one, but he didn't want to share it. So that's kind of like human nature, but Satan's got that to the nth degree. Let's look at Mark 13. This is a familiar scripture. Mark 13 and verse 20. It says, And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he choose, he shortens the days. So notice that it says no flesh will be saved. Well, that's animal flesh and human flesh. It would all be destroyed. Wouldn't be saved. But except for the elect's sake, because of them, it's going to make a change. Or change the outcome, I should say. Whom he chooses. So God chooses the elect. He chooses who he wants to call. He shortened the days because of them. So he, he's not going to allow it to go to complete destruction, but because of his family, whom he's working with, which is you and me and, and the ministry, he's going to shorten those days I mean, save them. I mean, that's very merciful for God. I mean, if he just turned his back, there wouldn't be nothing left. A few ants crawling around. Let's look at the first attempt of Satan. This guy just doesn't quit. Over in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, and starting in verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. So he fell from heaven and he landed on the ground, obviously on the earth. For you have said in your heart, this is what he... This is what was internalized in his heart. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation of the furthest north. I will ascend above the heights of clouds. I will be like the most high. So what's he saying here? He's, he's going to go up to heaven. He's going to exalt his throne. Satan has a throne, but he's going to invoke exalt his throne above the stars of God, above all the angels. He will sit on the mount of congregations of the furthest north. He will ascend above the clouds because the third heaven is in the spirit realm. It's not in this universe. It's, it's above the clouds. He will be like the most high, but he won't just be like the most high. He wants to be the most high. Throw God off his throne and, and just take over. Notice his attempt here. What that was, what I just read his attempt. And now let's see what Christ said about Satan. Over in John, the 8th chapter, John 8 and verse 44, speaking of Satan, it says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And describing him, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. I mean, he, was, he, he committed the first lie. He, he told Eve that she would not surely die. And of course, the fact that they were going to, God had told him, 
they would die if they took of the fruit of the good and evil. By lying about them, it was accessory to murder because it would cause them death. So he was a murderer from the beginning. Not from the beginning of his creation. It took time for him to reach that point. He not only wanted to overthrow God, but wanted to kill him in a sense. That is, the intent of his evil heart. He destroy God. Just remember one thing, brethren. Satan hates God. He hates Christ. He hates the church and the members of the church and would like to see their downfall because he views us members as a threat to his plans. Look at how he's, he's described over in the book of Peter. In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in, in verse 8, here's Peter's admonition. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So the admonition is to be sober and to be vigilant, to be close to God, because the devil is the adversary, and he goes around seeking whom he may devour. But he looks for a lion doesn't look for strong animals he, he wants to. He looks for the weak and the sick. He looks to those brethren who are having difficulties, spiritual, spiritually not close to God as they should be. And he, he looks for weaknesses in their character, something he can exploit. And those are the ones he attacks. I mean, if you're, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, praying, studying, fasting occasionally, meditating, being close to God— you're not going to be a victim of Satan. I'm not saying you can't have trials. I mean, Job went through quite a trial. I mean, you know, lost his whole family, lost his, all his possessions. But once he repented, he, God blessed him abundantly above that. I'm talking about Satan looking for weaknesses in your character, whatever it is, getting you to compromise, maybe coming up with your own pet idea that you don't agree with the church. I mean, look, if you have some idea that is not exact and you don't agree 100% with what the church teaches, keep it to yourself. I mean, ages ago, before they changed, you know, the Pentecost from um, Monday to Sunday, there were ministers that understood that. They didn't go out and create division and try to get a following. They just waited for God. And when God was ready, he opened up Mr. Armstrong's mind, and it was changed. So have the same approach. I mean, you know, just, it, it'll, like the saying goes, it'll all come out in the wash. So he looks for the spiritually weak. Now let's look at the second attempt of Satan. I mean, insanity is described as doing, doing the same thing over again, expecting a different result. Over in Revelation 12, and uh, verse 7, it says, Revelation 12 and 7, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. So we know within the spirit realm there are different abilities and strengths. And Michael is in charge of, under Christ of the of the army, the, the, the angels that are created, you know, as an army, uh, as opposed to Gabriel, it sounds more of a messenger. But in verse eighteen, he did not prevail. Well, of course he didn't prevail. I mean, you got to be crazy to think you can pull that off. Nor was there a place found for him in heaven no longer. So although he has access at this point, because it does say in the book of Job that the sons of God, which refers to the angels, uh, were before the th throne of God, and and uh, even Satan was there, and God said, well, what do you think of my servant Job? So we know that he has access to the throne of God, and of course, he says that before the throne, his, before the throne, uh, day and night, accusing the brethren, well, it's, it's not that he's there 24 hours a day and night, but he's there, sometimes what we call day, sometimes what we call night, accusing the brethren, pointing out their sins, but 
after this war, he's, he's booted out, got no more access to heaven. So in verse 12, so the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who what? Who deceives the whole world. Not just India or China or whatever. He deceives the whole world. And it's a great privilege to be in the church and not be deceived, because if you knew you were deceived, you wouldn't be. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the whole gang, demons and Satan, out, 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 out of heaven, down to the earth. So the great dragon was cast out, called the devil who deceives the horse. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The second attempt, which hasn't occurred yet as far as, well, that's my opinion now. You know, I don't think it has occurred. The second attempt will fail. And also, and of course, after that, Satan will be restrained when Christ returns. He'll be just, he won't be able to influence, uh, you know, people at the, during the millennium. He'll, he'll be uh, restrained at that time. Let's go over to Revelation 20 and verse uh, 1 to 3. Uh, Revelation 20 and verse 1, it says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottle of the spit and a great chain in his hand. So it's possible to restrain Satan with a chain. So it's obviously not a physical chain. It has to be a spirit chain, uh, you know, composed of spirit that can restrain him. <clears throat> he laid hold of the dragon and the serpent of old, who is the devil, the Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottom of the spit and shut him up. Now, I, I don't know where that is. It, uh, the Bible is not clear. You can speculate, but we just don't know. And set a seal on him so that it shouldn't deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And after these things, he must be released for a little while because God has a something for him to do to test the people on the earth. So after the release, uh, he will negatively oppress. He will affect mankind after his release, but of course, after that, he's facing judgment, so. And Revelation 20, carrying on in verse 7, it says, And when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. He'll be let loose, you might say. And he will go out and deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle those whose numbers as the sand of the sea I mean, it's just unbelievable that after a thousand years of, you know, the millennium, that you can get the idea that you can go and uh, battle with with Christ, essentially, and the, at Jerusalem. They went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. So we're going to, the same idea, we're going to take over here of the beloved city. That's Jerusalem. And what happened? Fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And that was the end of that. I mean, there was no warning saying, you know, we better back off. And no, it was just bang, fire, gone, toast, ashes on the ground. Well, it talks about wicked are the ashes on their feet. Well, there's, there are the ashes. Okay. Let's look at the, the fourth example here, the mission statement of God. God has a mission statement too. It can be explained this way to expand the family of God currently existing of God the Father and Jesus Christ to include millions of sons and daughters who are tested while in the flesh to see if they will submit to God, obey him, and remain faithful to the end. So that's the test for us now, brethren. If we do that, it's going to be great. This process is achieved by God calling us into his church and for those who repent and accept Christ as their personal Savior and are baptized, they receive God's Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands by the ministry and then grow in grace and knowledge with God's help. Let's go over to Acts and verse 18. Acts 8 and verse 18. It says, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. 
unbelievable frame of mind. You could tell that he he was not um, called to might say he wanted he was in it for the money, wrong the wrong reason. So if you endure to the end, what what do you get out of it? Let's look at Matthew twenty four. And verse 13, it says, But he who endures till the end shall be saved, saved and also receive their reward. Over in Revelation 3, it discusses what that reward is. Over Revelation 3 and verse 11, Christ speaking, Behold, I am coming quickly. What's the admonition? Hold fast to what you have, that no one may endure and take your crown. So endurance is a matter of holding fast. There's some effort in it. Hold on tight, in other words. Over in James, in the first chapter, and verse 12, James speaking here, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life of which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So that's the promise from God, a crown of those who love God. And that love is for God is proven by keeping the first four commandments, which demonstrate how to love God. So people that say, well, I, I love God. Well, do you keep the Sabbath? No, I don't, I don't keep that. I keep Sunday. Well, you don't love God. Oh, I love God. Is that an idol in your bedroom? Yeah, but I love God. No, you don't. You're worship, worshiping idols. And if you're using God's name in vain and not repenting of that, you're not loving God. And if you're not keeping the holidays, you're not showing love to God. So there's a lot of uh, hypocrisy out there. People are deceived into thinking they're loving God, and yet they refuse to obey the first four commandments, which includes the annual Sabbaths too. You know, it talks about my Sabbaths, hello my Sabbaths, plural. So that's how you, when you attend the feast, you're demonstrating love for God. You know, you're not pushing back and say, well, I want to keep Sunday, I want to keep Easter, I want to keep this or that. You're just obeying. And that's proof of love for God. I don't think God could ask any more of you to obey, seek obedience, endure to the end, and for that, you get a great reward. Look at over in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, in verse 25, Paul speaking here, he says, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. So what he's saying here is, if you're running in a race and you're trying to compete for the, for the prize of running, you don't go out, you know, every night of the week and, eat and gain weight and you're all sweaty and you know there's a big fat beer gut and you're going to run in a race you're not going to get too far now they do not they do it to obtain a perishable crown so they get a little crown of whatever leaves in that and it, it's perishable because it's it's physical but we an imperishable crown in other words our crown is permanent it's not temporary it's permanent it never perishes you know it won't be rusting on you because <laughs> things of like that rush or rust or corrode physical things. Over in uh, Second Timothy, the uh, fourth chapter, Second Timothy four and verse eight, it says, "Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness." In other words, at the end, there's the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only me, but all those who have loved his appearance, all those who have demonstrated their love by obeying his first four commandments, Christ himself in person will give you that crown. And it says a white raiment, you know, a white robe, which signifies righteousness, and an imperishable crown. Why wouldn't you want that? I mean, with eternal life, I mean, if people could only get their minds around what really God has in store for them, it it just blows you away. I mean, it, it's like you, it's beyond your wildest dream. 
I mean, Solomon, I mean, he, he had it all, right? I mean, he, had, he was a king over Israel. I mean, he had big army. I mean, he built a the beautiful temple. He built a beautiful home. The Queen of Sheba comes up. She sees the servant. She sees the gold. She sees the silver. She sees the glory, the magnificent. She was, she's like, took her breath away, like pass out. It was so great. And yet, what did he say in the end? That's just physical. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Is that complicated? And yet he, he come to the understanding that everything else is just temporary. It's just a lot of wind. I mean, if you're wealthy and you're blessed by God, that's great. I mean, you know, if you have a nice home in that, that's really great. It's only temporary. If you die before Christ returns, you can't take it with you. And if you're fortunate enough and God has mercy on you and you go to the place of safety, you have to leave it all behind. You can't take it with you. You can't take your bank account with you to the place of safety. I mean, it's only temporary. And the things that really count, brethren, are God's law, loving God, serving God, doing your best, and at the end, receiving the reward that God has in mind for you. He's anxious to give it to you. He's not trying to hold back. Where was I? Oh, let's go over into Revelation 2 um, and verse 10. Revelation 2.10, it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. This is, these are some brethren he was warning about that you may be tested. So they were going to be tested in prison, and you will have tribulation 10 days. So they're going to have tribulation for 10 days, and then be faithful unto death. They were going to be killed. So they knew in advance they're going to jail for 10 days, going to be tribulation, tortured or whatever, and then they're going to be killed. And he says, and I will give you the crown of life. But at the end of it all, that's what you get, the crown of life. And over in Revelation 3, and verse 11, it says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one take your crown. So he says, he didn't say, I'm really coming quickly. Don't worry about holding fast. Just slack off and, you know, you don't have to worry about it. You'll still get your crown. No. Hold fast. Endure to the end. These are the admonitions. Hang in there. And what do you get? You'll receive your crown. I mean, he said, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, how better can you describe that? He's anxious to reward you for your obedience and your service and your loyalty and hanging in there. He's not trying to withhold anything from you. There's no question that those who are on the first resurrection, the first resurrection receive a crown and eternal life as a reward. And that's, you can't ask for anything more than that. All these things that Solomon had, you will have, I mean, you'll have that plus some. And sharing, we don't lose that. It's, it's very crucial that you ensure that you don't lose out, brethren. We can't look back. Let's look at what uh, Luke says in, in verse, uh, the ninth chapter, in verse 62, it says, But Jesus said to them, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. In other words, if you've determined you're going to go through with it, you've got your hand to the plow, and all of a sudden you, you have second thoughts and reservations, and you know, oh, I want to go back to the old ways. I, mean, I was so much better in Egypt. We had all the garlic and onions. I mean, you know, look at this, man. I'm getting tired of this. I mean, brethren... You can't do that. Look what happened to Lot's wife when she was looking back. The desire to return to her old ways and lifestyle. In Genesis 19 and verse 26. Here, another scripture that you're familiar with. It says, But his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. She didn't become the salt of the earth in that sense, but she just became a pillar of salt. So that was, God took seriously about this looking back aspect, and he does for us too. Once you're committed, if you're going to receive the reward, you have to stick to it. And listen, 
I know you need God's help. I mean, we couldn't even get out of bed in the morning without God's help. So we have to stick to it. As we have examined today, there are many mission statements applicable to companies, ourselves, the church, Satan, and even God. Each has a designated purpose to achieve an end. Some are evil ends in regards to Satan and the mission statement, his mission statement and his agenda. Others are more positive in regards to companies, individuals, and the Church of God. Positive results. The bottom line is God wants us in his family. And he will do everything to assist us in the process. But we have to do our part with zeal and never, never ever give up. Brethren, quitting cannot be a part of our vocabulary or our goal.